Hello, everybody. I'm going to turn this just down a little bit. Uh, my name is Danielle. I am the volunteer coordinator and outreach coordinator for Northwest Veg. And today we're going to be doing kind of a dual demo. Um, this session was inspired by wanting to do a demo about gravy, but I think that there are some fundamentals and foundation understandings and concepts for gravy that you can apply whether you're making chicken gravy or some kind of darker beefier gravy or a country gravy. So instead of making all three of those and revisiting those foundations over and over again, I thought it would be good for us to instead um, make a country gravy, which I think has some of the bigger challenges, period, just in the world of gravy, as well as um, especially if you're making it plant based. And then we are going to take uh, uh, some of those fundamentals and we're going to put them into making a chicken pot pie. And so we do want to have that creamy sauce that's gravy like. It's going to be a little thinner when we're making a chicken pot pie. Um, but we're going to go ahead and dive in. So you can see in this other camera here, I've got a hot skillet here. Actually, I'm going to turn that down just a little bit so I don't fry my phone. So what um, the gravy recipe I'm going to talk about for the country gravy, I'm going to be making a chorizo gravy, uh, which is super, super delicious. It's obviously very flavorful, but this would be great if you just wanted to make a basic country gravy or if you wanted to make a sausage gravy. Um, it's very, very flexible. So for the chorizo, I'm going to be using the Tofurky um, chorizo style. And if you haven't seen it before, this is what it looks like. Um, chorizo is a Latin American um, spiced ground meat. It's gonna have a little bit more of a saucy, spicy taste to it than just normal ground hamburger, normal ground pork. Um, it's usually very finely cut. And um, I'm very, very grateful that they make it vegan. I also really enjoy the brand Soy Riso, if anybody has ever used that. So I'm only gonna be cooking about half of this. And you'll notice I am going, I put a little bit of oil in the skillet. Um, I am cooking this ahead of time. Now you can just use this straight. Like if I was adding this to a scramble, um, I could just put this in the microwave and cook it up. But because gravies are so tricky um, and because texture is so important with gravy, I am cooking this ahead of time and I'm cooking it on a skillet and I'm not microwaving it. And as we go into the foundation of gravy, you'll kind of learn why. Let me grab my spatula here so I can break this up. We talked about frying um, a little bit in some of the other series um, and kind of the chemical reaction that is happening when we're frying something. And so when we make a gravy, that is crucial. The, the frying component to make um, a good, creamy, flavorful gravy is almost the most important chemical reaction that's happening. And so we're gonna add it, we're, we're leaning into that with the chorizo. What I'm doing when I am cooking this on the skillet um, with oil and I'm not just like microwaving this or just heating it up is the oil is coating this meat and it's kind of creating that crisp outer shell to it. Obviously I don't want it to be like crispy. Nobody wants like a crunchy country gravy. Um, but we are wanting to insulate it because it is going to be living inside kind of a goo. And if we didn't insulate it, it one wouldn't unlock the flavor. We know that heating things up helps to unlock the flavor, but two, um, it would end up absorbing and neutralizing a lot of the flavor of our gravy because it wouldn't be insulated with a little fried shell. So you can see already uh, just in a little bit, it doesn't take much because it's already mostly pre-cooked. Um, you can see this is already getting, um, grab my lamp here. This is already getting kind of a nice brown uh, on the bottom of it. So we don't need to cook this for too, too long, just long enough to give it that little coat, that little protective shell. And then also, if I was making this um, with any kind of product that 
exuded its own juices. So like, for instance, if I was making this with Beyond Beef and you know, when you throw Beyond Beef into the skillet, it like creates its own juices. So you're not having to oil the skillet as much. I would remove the meat, but I would leave the juices in the skillet because that's gonna be important for, um, for making our gravy. So I'm gonna go ahead and set this aside. Let me grab a plate to put this on. And since this didn't really leave a ton of juice of its own, um, I don't have to worry about how I'm separating that. Um, so I'm just gonna set it aside on a plate. I'm mean, gonna keep the same skillet, which is important because there is some seasoning. We've got a little bit of the grease and the um, flavoring from that. And now, um, with, now we're gonna make a roux. So if anyone is familiar with a roux, um, it's super important for gravies, any kind of mother sauce, like a French based or a European, a European sauce. Now you can play hard and fast with a roux, but there are some basic foundations that we're going to practice with it. One is, um, if you're making a dark roux, so first of all, what is roux? Roux is fat and a starch mixed together over heat. The starch becomes toasted. And then it starts to, um, let me turn this down actually a little bit first. So um, when we're making a roux, what's happening is we've taken our fat. Traditionally, it would be made with some kind of lard or things like that. Uh, a lot of mother sauces will use butter. Uh, I'm obviously using Earth Balance um, today. And then uh, starch, it can be rice flour. I would recommend using a white rice flour if you're making this gluten-free. Uh, it can be all-purpose flour, chickpea flour. You can use cornstarch. I would not make a roux with cornstarch. Cornstarch is better for thickening, um, but a part of roux, we're thickening and we're creating flavor. So that's why like, I would use a rice or I would use, um, you could use chickpea because that certainly has flavor to it um, or traditional flour. Cornstarch doesn't have a flavor anybody's looking for. But um, what we're doing when we're creating that roux is we're taking equal parts, roughly equal parts fat and equal part starch, and we're combining them over, um, you can make it in the oven, but it's a several hours long process. And then you have like a little less flexibility to kind of maneuver as you need to. Um, so I, I traditionally make it over the skillet. What's happening when we're doing this is we've melted the fat, the fat's just kind of floating around. Then we add in our starch and we're adding in the starch and we're whisking it on a regular basis. Two things are happening. One, those starch molecules, um, they're chains. So if you imagine them as just like slinkies. So these starch molecules are getting coated with the fat, which is great because if you've ever been making a gravy and you needed to thicken it and you thought, what if I just added one tablespoon or even just a teaspoon of flour? Like it just needs a little bit more thickening. And then you end up with this like encapsulated blob, um, which is like a, you've created this really nasty dough dumpling that's just floating in your gravy now. And you have to chase it around and you have to try to mash it against um, the pot to try to, to take care of it. What has happened in that instance is all of those slinky chains interacted with the liquid, with the milk, with the water, with the heat, and they immediately built a wall and insulated so that the inside of your flour wasn't able, those particles weren't able to get out and do their thickening. What the roux does is it coats all of those chains of slinkies of proteins. And so it's individually, each one is now coated. And so then when we add in milk, all of those slinkies can now latch together and they can be evenly distributed throughout our milk, throughout uh, our broth, whatever it is that we're making. And then they can just thicken by being floating around instead of being one big clump. Depending on what kind of roux you're making um, would also depend on like, well, what kind of sauce you're making would help tell you what kind of roux you're making. So the what the heat is doing, it is actually toasting the flour or the starch that you're putting in there. So if I was gonna make like a macaroni and cheese and I needed to thicken it up um, or for a country gravy, 
I don't want a toasty flavor, right? Like you don't necessarily want it to taste like I took the macaroni and cheese, put it into toast somehow and toasted it. So for that, we're looking for the cheese, um, the onion, the truffle, whatever it is that we're putting in our mac and cheese. We want that to be the focus point of our flavors, not the toast. So in that in instance, we would make a very light roux. And what we would do with that is all roux ingredients, you, it's 50-50 either way, butter, flour. But I would take it off the heat as soon as it starts to turn blonde or like a light gold. Because then what we've accomplished is we have insulated all of those little chains of gluten, um, all of those starch particles, but we're not cooking it. We just helped make sure everything got evenly distributed. Now, if I was gonna make something, if I was gonna make like a beef broth, or if I was gonna make a Cajun dish, and I really wanted some complex, deeper flavors, something that would go with like a red wine, um, then in that instance, I would want a darker roux. So if I'm making like a beef broth or, um, or something like that, then even if I was making like a Japanese dish that was gonna have some miso and some other stronger dish flavors, then I might want that toasty flavor. And then I would make a darker roux. So that means I would keep it on the skillet longer. You wanna have it on low heat because roux are incredibly easy, just like with toast, to burn, right? You've checked your toast. If you put it under the broiler, you can check it, you can check it. It's not done, it's not done. You turn your back for one second, you come back, it's burned. Roux is exactly the same way. So um, we keep our eye on it, we are moving it all the time in the skillet. So that's just kind of a high level chemistry concept of what we're doing when we're making this roux. So we'll go ahead and heat the skillet back up. And then, um, so we're gonna be making a blonde roux because we're making a country gravy. So obviously I don't want to have a toasty flavor um, with that country gravy. The other ingredients that I'm gonna be using um, is we're using, I'm gonna be doing coconut milk for this one. Um, you can use soy milk. I have not had the best success with um, almond milk. I haven't used oat milk. Oat milk might work too, because it's got some nice fats in it. Um, but what we're looking for is fat and sugar. So we want to make sure that's why rice milk, almond milk, they're a little more on the watery side. And um, if that's the case, if you're, if you're in a situation where you needed to use that, I also wouldn't necessarily use cashew cream. Um, you could use cashew milk, but uh, you definitely want to make sure. Uh, I traditionally, when I have soy milk, I get unsweetened regular, but you can see I've got the original. That's because I need that sugar. And it is something that is going to work so much better for your gravy if the sugar is in your starting point and you're not adding sugar in. That's a totally different chemical reaction. So trying to force sugar into something that's already happening on the skillet is very different. So I guess if I was in a situation where I didn't have sweetened soy milk, um, then I would probably try to microwave, make some simple syrup, uh, microwave a little bit of sugar into the milk beforehand before adding it and making it um, because you don't want a sweet gravy, not for biscuits and gravy or chorizo gravy. Um, and so somehow when you are trying to play catch up and you're trying to add sugar into your gravy afterwards, you end up with the sweetness at the front of the taste, but then also lack of depth of flavor because that sugar wasn't there to interact right as soon as you started adding things in. So those are the milks that I would recommend using. Um, I, I'm not sure if I wanna use soy milk or coconut milk. I might use, um, I could use half and half. I thought the coconut milk would be nice because it would kind of like add kind of a depth to it. I think having kind of that uh, sweet coconut with the spicy, um, with the spicy chorizo could be really nice depending on like what kind of biscuits or dish you're making it on. So I will have to see, I think I'm gonna use the coconut, especially since I just opened it up. So my skillet's hot now. I'm gonna go ahead and add in my fat. Now, if I was making a brown gravy um, or a, a beef gravy, a chicken gravy, anything like that, um, I would, and you can see it browning at the edges here. 
Um, that's because that's that flavor from our chorizo. So that's that's looking great already. Um, if I was making a traditional gravy that I'm gonna put on mashed potatoes uh, and not a country gravy, I would make this in a small pot. But with a country gravy, because we're dealing kind of with a higher flour constitution and more ingredients, it's thicker, we've got the sausage, we've got whatever it is that we're adding into it, um, it works a thousand percent better to do it on a skillet. Um, when you do it in a pot, you've got layers up on top that might not be cooking at the same level. So then you could end up frying the bottom and having a runny top, and that's not what we're looking for. So my butter has just melted, that's great. I'm gonna go ahead and add in my flour. As soon as you add it in, you start whisking. And it's always better to start off with less flour than you need and add in more because you do not wanna to have to chase it. This, because I've kept the, um, because I have kept the sauce from the, um, from the sausage, it can be a little tricky to be able to tell what color this is. So that's, but if you go like this and you see it not filling in immediately, you can tell, okay, this is cooking. This is thickening up. This is gonna be great for um, adding in our milk. I'm gonna add in just a little bit more flour but it's got a great thickening to it. So I'm gonna do just about half of a tablespoon more. And just mix, mix, mix. So this is the secret number one, and it adds flavor because it's got that toasted flour. This is why your gravy is gonna have a really nice, good flavor. Um, and it's also why it's not gonna be lumpy. Look how quickly that um, dissipates in that. And we just keep it moving and we want it to lose the grainy texture. Like, I don't know if you can see, but it's got, almost, it's got kind of a beady grain to it. And you don't want your, your gravy to taste like raw flour was dumped into it. So we just, we, we actually do wanna cook it. We're breaking those down. Now, something else to know about these chains, that slinky image of these chains of our um, starches, is the darker roux you make, the less thickening it's gonna give you. So, <clears throat> so if I was making a Cajun dish or something for, um, <clears throat> something to go with miso um, or something that was gonna have like a lot of red wine and things like that in it, and I wanted the darkest roux possible, which would be almost kind of like, um, they use shades of peanut butter to kind of give you examples. Like a blonde should be um, almost like brown sugar and butter mixed together, but you can make a roux that's a dark brown sugar color. That would be a dark roux. So if I was making it that way, the starches are breaking, that chain is breaking down shorter, shorter, shorter and they're getting coated and isolated with that fat. The longer this is staying on the stove top, the more those chains are breaking down and getting isolated and they're all kind of getting into their own little compartments, smaller and smaller. So if I was gonna make a really dark roux, then I would be in a situation where I would um, need to make more roux to thicken whatever it is I'm making. So if I had a big pot of soup or I was gonna make a big pot of gravy, um, I would definitely look at the ingredients and, and look at the recipe. And if it says make a dark roux, I'll probably make more than I need because all those little short chains, they will still thicken, but they're not gonna hold together and connect in such a way that it holds up and thickens the whole pot. It'll just kind of do small, smaller steps in thickening, if that makes any sense. So you can see, We've changed in color just a little bit and it keeps expanding, right? Like I, I scrape it together and then it expands and starts filling up the pot or the pan. And this is another reason we're not making this in a pot, although you can make a roux in a pot. Um, if I was making, again, if I was making a traditional gravy, I would go ahead and start in a pot. Um, but because we're making our country gravy, we're doing it in the skillet and it just keeps filling out. And I wanna make sure that I'm getting the top push down to the bottom 
and we are losing that grainy texture. Now it's getting more of a smooth, you really do want it to almost have a peanut butter like texture. And so as soon as you don't see that it has like a grainy texture to it, but instead it's looking smoother and smoother, we're almost there. Once we get our roux taken care of, then there's two different things we can do. Um, if you've been with our sauce series before, you know that I feel very strongly about seasoning soups and sauces at the beginning because it's so hard to play catch up. Um, when we're making our roux right now, we're not doing that. Um, at the beginning stages of making a roux, you'll notice I didn't put any Italian seasoning in this. I didn't put any pepper in this. And the reason why is because this is all about isolating things in a small, um, in a small little cupboard of the oil, right? Like just like what we're doing with the starches, it's about cooking it and isolating it. So if I were to put my spices in at this point, well, at the beginning, if I had melted the butter and I had put in some delicious rosemary um, and a little bit of thyme and a little bit of parsley, if I had done that, what would have happened? It would have gotten encapsulated. We've given off a little bit of its flavor, uh, but it would have gotten coated with the flour and then encapsulated. So that flavor would have been lost. So that's why we don't put it in at the beginning. But once this roux comes into existence and is done, then it's not there to capture and to trap things into little capsules anymore. It's its own entity, essentially. It's just waiting to spill out into the rest of our gravy. So that's fine. Um, it's totally fine. We can start flavoring it. So I'm gonna go ahead, this guy's ready. So before I add in our milk, um, I have an herb blend here. This is just a salad dressing. It's um, parsley, red onion, chive, shallots, garlic, dill. So I'm just gonna take just a little bit of that. I don't like a lot of that, especially because it's got dill. And then I'm gonna take some garlic and herb. This has a little bit of rosemary, a little bit of thyme, and just a little bit of that too. We don't want, we don't want this to be too loud and we can add more as needed, but we're in a foundational state. And then I like my country gravy with black pepper. So I'm gonna put just a touch of black pepper. Mix this up. And again, you can see we're getting into a, again, a peanut buttery kind of texture when I was leaving it alone. And now we can go ahead and add our milk. I'll go ahead and pour in, um, I've got my coconut milk here. And start, start with half of the milk that you're thinking you're gonna wanna use. And again, you can add more, but you do not want to be in a situation where you have to play catch up and you're trying to thicken uh, because you've already started the root. The root is the thickening foundation. So it's easier to add liquid than it is to try to figure out how to thicken your gravy. So we're just going to go ahead, mix this up, make sure the bottom and the sides, the sides have a lot of flavor and stuff likes to cook and climb up there, get all that. And you can see it's already thickening up as I scrape the bottom. There's that minute, that second there in between. We're gonna go ahead and whisk again. And the whisking is just breaking that roux up even more, just helping it get dissipated and thicken things up. And I can see that this is gonna be pretty thick. So I am gonna add in just a touch more of my milk because my roux is doing such a good job. And we wanna keep our heat at medium low with this uh, because again, you can burn this so easily. So we just wanna keep it nice and slow. And if you have to play catch up, you can. Um, another thing to look out for with our gravies, we don't want our gravy to have, um, we don't want our gravy to have a peanut butter texture, right? Like nobody wants something that kind of has the texture of hot peanut butter. So if it's not looking like a, something you would ladle, then you're gonna wanna add in a little bit more milk. And that doesn't surprise me with this because I know all the thick stuff came out first. So I've got some moisture to make up for. And then I'll just kind of stir it back here. 
So this is um, a country gravy recipe that uh, is great because I really missed gravy, um, country gravy when I first started being vegan. And it goes great on hash browns and biscuits and all kinds of things. Um, I even like making like a loaded burrito, a breakfast burrito, and then you can top it with a chorizo uh, gravy, which is super delicious. So we can see this is starting to get more ladle-y, something I would use a ladle on. Roux was actually invented by the Sun King in France. And it was pretty revolutionary in the cooking world when it came out and it had a, in the French cooking world and it had a really big impact. Um, and that's why, like I said, it's, it's kind of the foundation for a bechamel sauce, um, a lot of sauces that you might make nowadays. So I'm gonna add just a the rest of my can I still see that this is pretty thick, but we're getting there because you also don't want it to be too runny. So we're trying to walk that line. So I'll just add this in. Now let's say that I did end up adding too much milk or too much water to my gravy. If that's the case and you need to thicken it up, we're okay, it's, it's a pain, but we're not doomed. Um, because what we'll wanna do is we do not wanna reach for the flour if for some reason you're feeling really extra that day, then you could get another skillet and you can make more roux if that's what you want to do. Um, you're absolutely, you're not, in, you're not going to go wrong with that. But um, what you can also do is you can add in cornstarch. So in that situation, what I would do is I would take, um, I would take a small amount of water, think like three tablespoons of water. And I would add a half a teaspoon of cornstarch. And the water needs to be cold because if it's warm, you're gonna get a different chemical reaction. So it needs to be cold. And then I would take that teaspoon of cornstarch and mix it really thoroughly with a knife, a whisk, whatever. And then you've got your tiny little cup with your three tablespoons of water. Add that in half at a time. So just add in half, let it kind of sit with the heat, stir it, check it out, uh, see if you see it thickening. If you don't, then go ahead and add in the other half because you don't want to be chasing and then be like, oh, now I've made a jelly. So let me add in more water. Oops, now it's running again. Because what the cornstarch is doing is it's absorbing flavor too. So if you've worked really hard to have this like foundation of deep flavor and then you add in a tablespoon of cornstarch, it is going to neutralize some of that flavor. So we want to use it sparingly if we can, but texture is so important with gravy that you're not gonna be in rough shape if you have to use a little bit of it because it's, it's important that you're not just serving a wet leaky sauce, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and see if I can get my lamp over here. So that way you can see a little bit better without me. This is a great gravy consistency. Stripping off my spoon. Um, but it's also, it's gonna thicken as soon as we take it off. Uh, for folks who have been in demos with me before, you know that I'm always talking about that resting period. So um, this is, gravy always gets thicker, 100%. Those starches, anytime you're dealing with anything that has a starch in it, it gets thicker after it's been removed from the heat. So this is a great time um, for me to go ahead and add in the chorizo. the sausage or whatever, grilled onions, caramelized grilled onions um, smothered with country gravy, beautiful thing. So I wanna make sure I'm evenly distributing this. This is gonna change the color of my gravy um, because obviously those sauces are gonna get in there. So it's gonna turn kind of this like swirly rust red. And we wanna make sure that we're evenly distributing that. As good as gravy is, nobody wants just three tablespoons of normal gravy and then one big bite of any ingredient, whether that's dough, whether that's chorizo, sausage. So we want this to be really evenly distributed. And I'm smelling like that coconut milk is really starting to sweeten from the heat. 
Um, so this is gonna have a sweet and spicy component, which I think is gonna be really good. Um, so yeah, I would pair this, like I said, I think a breakfast burrito uh, would be really, really good. Or if you were gonna do like a potato hash um, with some sweet potatoes, or if you wanted to do um, just biscuits, biscuits with a chorizo gravy. Um, and I think that the sweetness of the coconut milk would be really good. Now, if you wanted to, if you had to, you could make this with cashew cream, with blended cashews that we talked about in one of the sauce series, but boy, it sure would be hard. Like you would skip the roux phase um, because you, cashew cream is already so thick, unless you made it really thin, unless you made it really watery and you didn't make it with the Alfredo texture, then you would still make the roux, but cashew cream neutralizes subtle flavors so intensely that I think you would need to, I think you would need to use some louder seasonings like garlic, um, maybe fresh ground pepper and quite a bit more of it. Um, something along the, like maybe a lot of really concentrated dried herbs. And then I would top it with fresh herbs, which again, remembering we don't put our fresh herbs in, in the cooking stages because they'll turn bitter, they'll wilt. Um, they will not look good, nor will they taste as good. So I would top it with fresh herbs. If you were wanting to skip the root phase and do something oil-free, you can make, I have made gravy with just um, cashew cream, um, but it's not, it's not as, it doesn't pack the same punch. So go ahead and bring this up here. Uh, there we go. Um, so we've got a really good gravy texture now. Um, you can see it's, it's ready to be ladled. It's nice and drippy. Um, and you can see how much the color has changed as well. So our gravy is done. Um, so now kind of taking that fundamental that we have um, for making gravy and making roux and things like that, we're gonna go ahead and get started on our chicken pot pie. So I've done a couple of things here with our chicken pot pie. Uh, we do wanna give all of our solid ingredients kind of a head start. So uh, we don't want to, let's see here, I'm gonna move this over here. Let's see here, there we go. I think that's looking good. Okay, um, so we don't, we wanna give kind of a head start. We don't want that chicken pot pie or any pot pie that you're making. You don't want it to have like a crunchy onion or a crunchy carrot in it. So we also wanna give everything a chance to unlock those flavors, which if it was just going from a raw state straight into the oven, it's not gonna have the same chances unless I was putting it in like a glass casserole dish tossed with a little bit of oil and seasoning and cooking it that way first and then putting it in the pie but we would worry about the even breaking down. It's a lot harder to kind of control how much things are cooking. So we're just gonna do a little pre-cook. So I've got uh, half an onion here. I also have um, about a Ziploc bag full of mushrooms. And the mushrooms are really nice. They're gonna help fill out for when we don't have as much chicken. Uh, they also help give like kind of an earthy flavor. They have so much moisture in them. So they're really good for helping prevent things from drying out. I also had like five Brussels sprouts left <laughs> over that I found in the bottom of my fridge. So I'm gonna be adding in my five Brussels sprouts. And I also um, went and bought some Chinese carrot. So I'm gonna be adding in quite a bit of carrot. Now this is going to make more than I'm going to have room to put in the um, pie, which is fine. I'll set it aside uh, if I want to make a stock with it or I want to put it on pasta later, whatever the situation is, I can. And just in case folks aren't super familiar, um, so up in my neck of the woods, we have access to Chinese carrots, which I really recommend if you have an Asian market nearby, that you can go to, um, I would recommend getting Chinese carrots. Um, they're usually, at least from my experience, they're usually cheaper than the carrots that you're going to find, um, the traditional carrots that we're used to seeing in America. And they have a higher sugar content. 
So you know the difference between when you just eat um, corn versus when you have like sweet corn, that difference, uh, it's, it's amazing. It's so good. Um, so I really recommend it. It enhances the flavor because you're not just eating sugary carrot. Um, sugar and salt are both things that can enhance and bring out flavor. And so this, when you take a bite of a Chinese carrot, you think, oh my gosh, yes, carrot. That's what it tastes like. It's not just a vehicle for ranch or whatever uh, you may be using it for. So I really recommend that uh, if you get a chance, check it out, try to find it at your local store because Chinese carrot goes a long way. So I'm just gonna stir this up. I put in just about a tablespoon of olive oil. This is a time when um, oil doesn't really play that important of a role. So if you just wanna use water or broth, what we're doing is we're just getting everything to kind of release its juices, soften up just a little bit. We don't want things to get mushy. We don't want things to be cooked enough for me to like smash with a fork or anything like that. Um, we just want everything to kind of start having a good flavor. Now, if you like celery, this would be a great thing to put celery in. I do not like celery, so I have abstained from it. And while this is cooking, I'm going to go ahead and um, I am using tofurkey. I think I got rid of the box. Um, I'm using tofurkey's chicken. Um, so these are just little cubed bits of chicken. Um, so I'll be putting that in for my chicken pot pie. So I am going to cook it up ahead of time very similar to what I did with the chorizo. We don't want it to be crispy. We don't want it to be like super browned on the outside. We're insulating it so that it doesn't sit in juices and get spongy and mushy. Uh, we want it to keep its flavor and keep its texture. So I am gonna put a little bit of oil in the skillet. I'm just gonna brown it up while we're browning up our vegetables. And I am gonna toss just a little bit of salt and pepper with this because this is uh, the crucial time for, fl for flavoring and seasoning. So for starting off, just a little bit, I've got some uh, Himalayan pink salt. And again, we don't want this to taste salty and I'm gonna be adding in other things that have salt in it, like the broth. Um, so just a couple of shakes of salt at the most. And then some pepper. And then I am gonna put in just a little bit of the Italian seasoning. And I think uh, just a little bit of the salad dressing as well. That's uh, the salad, the salad herbs that have been freeze dried. So just a little bit of that. If you don't have any pre-mixed things on hand because you buy from bulk, which is great, um, or you just like to have things on hand so that you can mix and match. I would say, uh, you know, go with what flavor profile you're most comfortable with, but a good one for anything that you're doing that's going to be chicken related um, is pars or a little bit of dried parsley, a little bit of thyme, a little bit of oregano, little, little bit of oregano, um, but mostly thyme. Thyme would do you right, a um, little bit of sage, but I think if you just did a little bit of time, you'd be in good hands. So we're just going to cook this maybe for one or two minutes more. I'm going to go ahead and throw the chicken in. So we can get it cooking. Now I've heated up the oven at 350 degrees. And one thing I am gonna show you is I just put the chicken into the skillet and you can see this is quite a big piece of chicken, right? So make sure that you go through and break it up because in a chicken pot pie, maybe in a stir fry that would be okay. But again, with a pot pie, you kind of want a little bit of everything in every bite. So you don't necessarily want a thumb sized chunk. Um, this is also quite a big piece. Uh, so you don't necessarily want just one big blob of chicken. 
Now, if you're looking for something a little more whole foodsy, you can use chickpeas, it's great. I often make chickpea pot pie if I don't have any chicken on hand or if I'm looking to make something uh, a little bit more whole foodsy. So chickpeas are great, lentils are great as well. Um, so you can just boil up really al dente some of those uh, lentils and then mix those in with some broth and things like that. So uh, you don't have to use a, a protein. You can also of course use tofu, but uh, legumes make a great pot pie as well. So these are starting to sweat just a little bit. And so we're, we're getting to a point where they should be in a good spot. I'm just gonna, so I can just pierce some of this with a fork. That's perfect. We don't want it to go all the way through. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn off the heat for this and move it out of the way because we need to get started on our sauce. So we're gonna be doing the same thing that we did with the country gravy. We're gonna be making um, a roux and it's gonna be a blonde roux because we are not making, we don't want burnt toast flavor or anything too deep and dark flavored with our light thyme and chicken and mushroom. So um, it's gonna be pretty light, which is gonna be fine. We already know how to do this, but because I'm not trying to make something as thick as this, I mean, right? Uh, we don't want it to necessarily, we want it to be a little lighter because it's gonna cook and it needs to be like evenly coating uh, the vegetables and the chicken. If you've had a chicken pot pie and you've ever really thought about the sauce, you'll notice it is different. It isn't just gravy. It's not that thick, loopy texture. It's a little lighter. So we're gonna be making um, just a little bit less roux and then we're gonna be adding in more milk and then not just all milk, we're gonna be doing water as well um, because we don't need it to be super creamy. We're here for it to be a little lighter, a little more focused on the chicken flavor. Um, so we're gonna be putting in our chicken broth cubes as well. So we've got our veggies, we've got our chicken cooking. This is heating up. I'm gonna go ahead and get my butter in there. So last time I used about four tablespoons of butter. Now I'm gonna use just about two and a half tablespoons. Cause again, we're not looking to make it that thick. You can see this is pretty high temperature because I have such a sensitive oven stove top. Um, you don't want your butter to burn. So that would be something else. If you're making a complex roux, if you're making a roux that is um, gonna be darker, then you wanna worry about that burn rate of the oil you're choosing. So if I was gonna make um, a darker roux and I know that vegan butter burns and scalds really easy, which it does, uh, then I would probably just use a vegetable oil because it's got a higher burn rate, a higher smoke rate, um, a higher smoke temperature. So, but because we're using blonde and look at how easy it melts, super easy. Um, so now I, took that off the skillet just a little bit so it would just melt. Tossing this back in. So we want even amounts since we did two and a half. Do two that. And then immediately whisking. And it's gonna form, at first it's gonna start looking like, well, this is just one big clump. And that's okay. Um, we want it to start spreading out and it's gonna be thin. Like we've got quite a big pot here. Um, so I threw away my little pot because the handle was getting dangerously wonky. Um, so we're making it in quite a big pot, but either way, um, we're not looking to have it. We don't wanna have like a cup and a half of brew. And I'm stirring and mixing my chicken. Probably gonna take it off the heat because again, I don't wanna overcook that. Just wanna get the flavors going. So if I was gonna make a traditional chicken gravy, you could take what I'm gonna make here and you would just add in less um, water, more milk, 
um, or all water, depending on like, if you don't want it to be a creamy chicken gravy and you wanted it to be more bold, then you could just do broth, straight up veggie broth. Remember that veggie broth that we made a couple of weeks ago? That would be great for making this gravy. Um, that would be so flavorful. So um, you, can, you can make it your own and you just add in a little bit of liquid at a time and then keep stirring it, wait a couple of minutes and gravy needs your attention. Gravy is not something that you can just leave on the stovetop for five minutes while you go fold laundry. Uh, but it's a pretty quick thing. Like we've already busted out a country gravy. And so you can see because this doesn't have the same coloring, this isn't, this doesn't have the same uh, issues of the coloring that uh, the other one did because I didn't have the chorizo in it. This is very blonde, but you can also see right now it still has, I don't know if I can show this without blinding everybody. It still has kind of a grainy texture. It still has a little bit of clumpy texture on it. So we're just gonna keep cooking it. But uh, it was hard to tell what color we were working with for a traditional roux because of the soy riso. So this is a really nice example of like, this is very, very blonde. It looks buttery, right? Because it is, half of it is butter. Um, so you can see every time I stop stirring it, it expands out, goes right back to expanding. And you don't always have to use your whisk, especially because we're using such a small amount. I can also use just a little rubber spatula. The point is we don't want it to burn. When we're dealing with something this small, because we are making so much less roux, um, it can burn so, so easily. So we're just always moving, getting our work out here, doing our stirring. And again, we want it to have a very light tan color. I'm trying to think of a color of food, maybe like mushroom, right? Uh, mushroom isn't necessarily that dark, but we want it to have kind of a light tan color. And that's how we know that the dough has been cooked. Nobody should be eating raw flour. It's not good for your tummy. It's not good for your taste buds. So I had to learn that lesson a couple of times when my family would be baking bread or something, especially like if you get some biscuits and then you, they didn't cook all the way, but you love how gooey they are in the middle. So you eat them anyways, you're gonna have a stomach ache. So nobody wants to have a stomach ache for their chicken pot pie. So let's see here, just give that just a second. I'm also gonna move this over here. I think my laptop is not thrilled about being over the stove top as much. All right, and it gives you this better light, less black. So we've got a less grainy texture now. Now it's got a little bit more of a soupy texture. I can still see some little bit of graininess. I'm gonna give this about another 60 seconds. And then um, I am gonna be adding in half milk, half water. So where did I put my... Um, so for making a sauce for my um, chicken pot pie, we we'll just do this much milk and then the same amount of water. Because again, I'm not trying to make a country gravy um, consistency. That'd be too creamy, too thick. So I would take that and then I'm gonna put in a uh, chicken broth cube. Once again, using one of my favorites, not chicken. So I'm going to put in one chicken broth cube. Um, I might end up putting in more depending on if my roux is feeling like it needs that. Yeah, this is looking good. I can smell it. It smells toasty. Um, smell is a really big indication. If you can start to smell it, it doesn't just smell like the kind of craft glue that you let kids learn how to make with flour and water. Uh, then you know your roux is your roux is there. So this is good. This is that color has changed. It's not just white and butter flavored anymore. Um, it's got that tan color to it. So this is good. This is ready to add our milk and our water. 
Now, I can add some seasonings to this sauce. If I do, I would make it really light. I think chicken pot pie should really be more of a light experience um, than having it be too much, taste too much like thyme. Um, the sauce should have the strongest essence of chicken flavor. Um, so I don't want it to have uh, a flavor that tastes too much like Italian seasoning or a flavor that tastes too much like parsley or anything like that. So I'm really looking for it to pack um, a chickeny flavor. Uh, so for that, um, I'm, I'm just gonna not really, I might add a little bit of pepper, uh, but since we seasoned the vegetables, I think that we're gonna be in a good spot for this. So you can see how watery this is, right? Like this is very, very watery. Um, I'm gonna wait for this guy to break down. And this might be a really good example for, we can go ahead and thicken it up a bit with cornstarch. But at the same time, when we put this into our um, baking, when we put it into our pie, or if you were doing something where you didn't wanna do it with a pie and you just wanted to make this into a casserole, um, then you absolutely, you don't have to put it in a pie shell. You could just bake this as kind of a casserole to serve over rice, which is very, very good. Um, we don't want it to be this thin, but we also don't want it to be as thick as our country gravy. If it's this thin, it's gonna drench our pie crust and it's gonna soak right through and then you're gonna have a mushy, uncooked casserole. Um, so that's not what anybody is looking for, but at the same time, if you made it as thick as a country gravy, everything is gonna solidify more because it's gonna lose moisture, it's gonna lose um, itself to that heat. And then you're gonna have like something that you can cut and then take out and hold like a brick. And that's gonna sit in your stomach like a brick. And it's also not gonna be as flavorful. So that's not what we're looking for. We're looking for almost like a, a thin gravy. We're getting a little thicker. Um, I can feel more resistance on my spoon as I stir. But for the sake of time, if I wasn't um, trying to get this going ASAP, then I would probably let this cook down because we can cook off that moisture. You can see the steam rising off of that. That's moisture leaving. I could reduce this down and I could have it um, get thicker within about 10 minutes. But if you're in a hurry and you're not wanting to do that, um, then no worries, you can go ahead and use the cornstarch. Let me grab some. So for your cornstarch, just like I said, we're gonna do two tablespoons roughly um, of water. And then we're gonna do half of a teaspoon of cornstarch. Go ahead and get that. And again, the water needs to be cold. Uh, warm cornstarch is gonna make it sludgy and gummy. Uh, we want that cornstarch to stay individual and ready to dive into and spread easily in our cold water. And once it gets poured into there, it can turn as gummy as it wants because it has a whole big playground. It's not gonna turn your whole thing gummy, but we don't want gummy in this. We don't wanna start off with that. So I've got my cold water to three tablespoons of water. And then we'll go ahead and do our teaspoon cornstarch. So you don't have to be too careful with that. You can see I just kind of like threw it in there. It's already starting to break down. Um, I will get my whisk, whisk this together. And it should just look like cloudy, milky sauce, right? So let's go ahead and see what this, ah, oh yeah, this is, this is thickening up already still um, on its own, which is making me, you can see it's like starting to get that viscosity on the spoon. Um, so it's like a little slow to leave. So it's not gonna take much of this, which is why we're not gonna pour all of this in there. We're gonna do it baby steps. So we go ahead and take a tablespoon Put it in there, go ahead and whisk. And I would also uh, recommend letting this sit for about five minutes before we put it into the sauce or into the pie. 
um, just because again, it's going to thicken up. So you want to make sure that you're not putting something in that's going to thicken up once it's off the heat and turn into something unmanageable. So I'm going to go ahead and give this a taste. And yep, that's got a good chickeny taste to it. It's creamy, it's chickeny. I think I'm gonna add a little bit of black pepper to this. And I think I'm gonna add half of another cube just because that creaminess is taking first and foremost flavor and the chicken is coming to my palate just a little bit after. And I don't want it to be too much because we know that uh, these have so much salt, right? Unless you get the low salt ones. So if I had uh, some more of that broth that we had made, um, I would probably add in some of that good broth. I do have some concentrate like bouillon um, that I could add into that, but I'll just go ahead and mix this up just a little bit more and then we'll do another taste test. So this is getting to the texture I would want this at. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and remove it from the heat. So that way we can let it sit. And again, like, so you can see, I'll put some of this in a little cup so you can see, I know it can be hard to tell from face on um, the texture. So let me grab, let me grab a little glass here. There we go. So you can see it's holding onto that ladle really nicely. Um, so this is the texture that we're working with. It run, it's runny. You can see it's coating that ladle very nicely, but it's not like a thick gravy, right? It, it's, it's very thin. So this is great. This is just the texture I'm looking for. Let me do another taste test and see how that extra addition of chicken cube has done. Yeah, yep, 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 yep. That's super good. Nice and chickeny, not too salty. If I had made it too salty, I could put just a touch of sugar or just a splash, like just the tiniest little squeeze of lemon, and that would cut through the saltiness. Um, but this is great. This is exactly what we're looking for. So we have just enough time here. I'm gonna grab my pie crust from my overstuffed freezer. I don't know if anybody else has their freezer set up like a hoarder, but my poor freezer works overtime for sure. So I've got some pie crusts here. Now, depending on your oven and depending on um, the kind of pie crust you get, you might want to blind bake your pie crust. Um, and so a blind bake is when you would put this in the oven and bake it for, you know, three minutes, just kind of browning the bottom so that this doesn't turn soupy. Um, you also always want to check your pie crust, to see if you have any cracks. You can tell this guy has a crack. So um, what I would do is I would make a paste. We did this um, for another one. I can't remember, I think our pumpkin pie <clears throat> or a pecan pie. I'd make a paste of flour and water and just like a tablespoon of flour, maybe half a teaspoon, a teaspoon, maybe two teaspoons of water until I had a paste that I could move around with my thumb, patch this up, and then I definitely would do a blind bake. Um, that's if I was gonna do that for our top one. I also got these unsweetened almond pie shells that I'm really excited about. Um, I wanted to try those out. I think that they could be really good. So um, I think I'm gonna use that pie shell, the one that has the crack as my top. So I'm not gonna be as worried about if it has a crack or not. And then because I'm not sure, I'm not super familiar with the almond ones, I feel like the bottom might be more forgiving. This is a little bit more shallow. 
than this is, but that's actually going to coat that pretty nicely. So what I would go ahead and do then is we want to take a mixing bowl, get a nice clear bowl here. So we want to take a bowl. This I think is going to be a good size for what we're working with. And we want to put our ingredients that we want to put in this pie into the bowl. So I'm going to take about half of the chicken because I know I cooked up more chicken than we're going to need. I'm going to put our sauce right here. Um, and then I'm going to just put in a tablespoon of the sauce, coat that, and then Let me get my veggies here. We're gonna add in our veggies. And the reason why we're not doing this all at one is because like I said, I know I have more veggies and I have more chicken and I have more sauce than we would make pies. So all of this can be something that I can put in the freezer. I can resource for another meal. And we just want everything to have a healthy coating of this sauce, right? Like we're not looking, we don't want it to be swimming in it, but we also don't want it to just be dry. So we're gonna do just a little bit more sauce. Let's see what that looks like. Yep, just a little bit more. This is looking pretty good. This looks like what you want it to look like when you get it out of your pie. So we know that we're gonna lose a little bit of moisture. So we want to be just a little wetter. Then we want it to be at the end. There we go. That's looking nice. I think you could do one more ladle full if you wanted to, but I wouldn't do more than that. One more. And then go ahead and put this over here, mix this up. We're not mixing this up in the pie because it'd be very rough on the pie crust. It'd be hard to evenly distribute the sauce. And we don't wanna put this warm ingredient in the pie crust and then fuss with it a bunch. Um, so we're, we're just gonna take this. Now we're gonna take this, put it into our pie crust. Make sure that everything is evenly distributed. Yep, there we go. I'm gonna put in just a little bit more of this. Now, if you're gonna use a top crust that is frozen, um, you have to walk this line between having it just a little bit thawed so it's a little malleable, right? Like you don't want it to just make this big weird crust tent on the top of your Thing because it's not gonna definitely it it needs to it needs to land safely on the the top of your pie, uh, but also you don't want it to be one big saggy sheet of dough. There, I think that's the perfect amount. Um, and you also want to be able to cut it right. Like you want to be able to make cuts on the top, and that's to let steam out. So we would we're gonna take this. I'm gonna set this down over here. I don't wanna put it on the hot oven. So very carefully, I just wanna get this pie out of here. And that's one of the reasons why I've kept it frozen. So you can see this top pie crust, too big. Uh, if I were to throw it in the oven like this, it would crumble and fall. So I'm going to take a sharp knife and trim along the edges here. And again, that's nice to do while it's frozen. It's going to be a little bit more easy to work with. If you were using fresh pie, crust. You could kind of fold it as you need it, but I have never been good at making fresh pie crust. That is just not a skill that I have. 
So frozen pie crust it is, which means I get to do exciting experiments like see what this almond crust is like. Okay. You can see I gave my pie crust a little haircut. Um, so now he's not hanging over. Now I need to make slits. I'm gonna make, um, I think, two crosses, one on either side here to let the steam out, which is very important for these pie crusts for when you're making a savory pie like this. Um, it's not just for looks. We, we definitely want the steam from this veg. We know those vegetables, are they're gonna have a lot to give off. I think I'm gonna do one dash here in the middle. So I have put in my little dashes here. We're gonna go ahead and put this in the oven, which has been preheated to 350 degrees. And we're gonna check it at 20 minutes. What we're really doing at this point is cooking the pie crust. All of the rest of our ingredients have been cooked, right? Like the chicken has been cooked, the veggies are, are, are crunchy, but we know that in 20 minutes of cooking at 350, they're gonna be soft. Our sauce is fine. So we're just getting the pie crust to catch up with everything and we're letting those veggies kind of simmer in their own sauces, absorb and enjoy and give back to that chicken sauce that we made. Um, so 20 minutes, I would check on it. And then if we start to see, oftentimes we'll see like the crust browning, but then the top is still soft. If that's the case, go ahead and take it out really quick, wrap some foil around the edges. So that way the crust doesn't keep burning and then let it bake for another 10 minutes and then go ahead and take it out, let it set. That's gonna let the sauce, all those juices from the veggies all finish mingling and then set. And then you can go ahead and serve. Um, does anybody have any questions? If anybody ever has any questions, you can feel free to email me at Danielle, D-A-N-I-E-L-L-E, -E, at nwveg.org. And thank you guys so much for being with us today.